This is Austin Real Estate Investing. Austin Real Estate Investing. We'll be discussing real estate investing in Austin, Texas, and bringing you experts from all different sectors of the real estate game. Your host, Jordan Moorhead, is a real estate agent and investor in Austin and is here to help you get started or to build your portfolio and explore new strategies. Hi, this is Jordan Moorhead with the Moorhead team, and this is Austin Real Estate Investing. Today, we've got Charles Devaney on here, and he's going to tell us all about how we can avoid paying too much in tax as real estate investors, something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I get questions about all the time of how do I avoid taxes and who should I talk to about avoiding taxes? Hey, Charles, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. So glad you're here. It's such an important thing to talk about. And I really wanted to get you on here before the year was over because yeah. I know there's a lot of stuff people can do between now and the end of the year, about a week from now, to avoid paying too much in tax for 2021. So I think we spoiled it a little bit, but who are you and how are you involved with real estate investing? Yeah. So I'm Charlie Devaney. Um, I've had my CPA license in Texas since 1990. Uh, I've been working with real estate investors about 20 years and the last two years really focusing on that for a long time. I was, uh, I went through industry and then I was, um, you know, CFO director of finance for some decent sized companies uh, and been in the virtual CPA CFO space for some time and segue to more focus on taxes the last couple of years and real estate in particular, just uh, it's super interesting. Uh, you work with some great people, some different people. Um, a lot of strong analytical people, the ones like the syndicators who are the best at this for everybody, you know, the, the, the passive and the active investors tend to be engineers. You know, they're not slick salesmen. They're people who are very analytical and hopefully you have a partner who's transparent. If you're a passive investor, you know, almost everyone I know is a passive investor wants to be a syndicator, you know, general partner down the road. So it's really good to be with the kind of people who will, who will teach you and show what's going on. And if they're giving you information, that's perfect. That's where you want to be. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of the stuff we'll talk about today can apply to anybody that's a real estate investor. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we will talk about, you know, what being a real estate professional is and how that can right. help you. And mm -hmm. what you need to do to qualify for that. I think that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think before we get started, that'd be a great place to start. So sure. what is a real estate professional and what do you need to do to qualify? Because a lot of people think, oh, it's just a realtor. And Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, you, there's a lot of people have real uh, the realtor license, but they're not real estate professionals because they just, they have a day job. Mm -hmm. You know, you're essentially looking at 750 hours in real estate. And that can include networking for real estate, meeting people, bird dogging, looking at property, doing some research. It should be over half of your income as well. Um, and that can be a, that can be an issue, but it's basically like if you're a W2, it's kind of hard to say you're also working 750 hours and then they're going to probably take a hard look at your income, you know, and this pretty good chance also with real estate investors, you have a loss. That's what we're looking for. You know, and, you know, you want to have a tax loss, tax loss, and then finally you have a big gain on the back end. And then maybe you're going to do a 1031 exchange or it goes to your heirs or you know, self-directed IRA. Um, so we're always kind of looking at reducing taxes in the near future. So the real estate professional is a great place to be. I work with a lot of people who are W-2s, maybe mid fifties who have been investing for a while and they're ready to do, do, do um, that next step. Um, and they, they understand the field and they're ready to, you know, that first year they can work part-time. They can have a W-2 job, kind of keep things going and help them qualify. But then they put the 750 hour and they're, and they also are making some money and yeah, you can get into it pretty much that first year out of retirement if you're making some money. Love it. Um, so real quick back to Austin, I know you're in mm -hmm. Austin. We actually met at a local yeah. meetup group in Austin that I try to frequent. Mm -hmm. you know, Casa Chocolat. It's yeah. Commercial Investors Lunch. I think it's every right. Tuesday. It's every Tuesday. Yes, yeah, right there, 183 and Burnett Road. Um, it's it's just great. I've met so many people. And you know, when you first start going there, you're just like jotting down, I'm gonna look that up. I'm gonna do some research. And uh, 
I, I feel like every day, every week I learn something and I got to do some more research and it's fantastic. You know, there's this, this people been doing this for 20, 30 years and the rules are always changing. Um, it's, it's, it's informal. There's not like a website or whatever. So I would encourage everybody if you're in town in Austin, it's Casa Chapala 183 and Burnett Road, uh, about 1130, 1145. Mm-hmm. There's no fees. You know, they like you to buy your lunch. So restaurant will make some money and you know, tip the waiters and all that. Yeah. And then there's uh, there's another one that's the uh, the first Monday that Joel Fine runs and he's big time syndicator. Same kind of story where he has a good W2, an engineer, and he's, he's one of those guys who very, is very transparent and people just love investing with him. And so what he does, he has a, a monthly and that's more like a happy hour. But uh, in, in that environment, there's a presentation. So that eats up a little bit of the time, but it's a, it's a different, you know, people have drinks and you know, <laughs> chips and whatever. So that's pretty fun. And that's uh, same location. Uh, normally the first Monday this year, that's January 3rd. So the meeting will be January 10th. Again, totally informal. Um, but I've met a lot of great people there and just learned a lot. You know, help, helping people connect. Sometimes it's not me. Like, hey, you should talk to them. Works out great. Um, you know, at that Tuesday lunch and people will stand up and say, what, you know, why are you here? And they'll say, you know, I have money to spend. I will, <laughs> I'm looking for my next passive investment or my first passive investment. Uh, and then they talk about their deals and, you know, the guy who runs it, we're going to be within the laws. So if it's a 506C and it's accredited investors only, you can stand up in a big, you know, in front of 40 people and, and pitch it. If it's a non-accredited 506B, then your hands are tied a little bit. You need to establish a relationship and not publicly talk about it. Mm-hmm. So that was yeah. a couple of things. Or just meet people to be, hey, that's going to be my partner, you know, and, yeah. and something that I can't quite afford by myself. Yeah, and I think it's so important when you're getting into real estate investing to get out there and meet people locally because you can listen to these podcasts uh, maybe they're oh, yeah. local, local podcast, but let's say the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is awesome. And you're listening to podcasts it's from five years ago, and this guy's in Kansas City. That's not Austin, you know? Yeah. Different yeah. Area. Right. And, you know, you're reading the body language. You know, is that guy serious about investing? You know, or, mm-hmm. um, you know it, that's one of the things jumping in a little bit in terms of, of good deals. Go look at the property, even though you're passive, you can't totally trust them. And, you know, the nice thing about Austin is you can drive to Dallas, Fort Worth in three hours, Houston in three hours, San Antonio in 70 minutes, and then everything in between. And the everything in between is really what the good opportunities are right now. It's, it's a little tougher in, in Austin. It's been great, but you got to be careful. So I guess leading to the top of our podcast yeah. here, what, what do you invest in in the Austin area? I know you, you're doing some investing here. You're also helping a lot of investors here. What intrigues you right now in the Austin area, or it could be Central Texas or anything? Yeah, I, about. I'm really intrigued by the exurbs, ex- exurbs, not just the suburbs, because you know here in Austin, just outside Round Rock and in Hay, Hayes County, um, Maynard, Pflugerville, they're just busting at the seams. You know, when I, I went to high school here, when I went to high school, there was there was one high school in Round Rock and one in Pflugerville. Now there's four or five each. And all these places are going crazy. So how far can you go where people and people don't necessarily have to work in Austin. And now we're seeing it with all the telecommuting, you know, the one advantage of COVID. Mm-hmm. So you can get farther, farther away. Um, so that's where I'm kind of looking at. You know, I, I looked at I heard about property today. A good friend of mine. We're thinking about maybe doing something. Um, and I'm going to. I'll, I'll go to you. You might know about this more. Than, you know, I do. It's not a tax question. They don't have a sewer line yet. And it's a lot of acres. So have, have you been in that environment where uh, they didn't have a sewer line yet? ETJ or it's a, an area where they're, they're going to be putting sewer in? Uh, no, there's not a firm commitment. It's, mm-hmm. it's a business friend, friendly uh, town outside of Austin, pretty close. You know, on paper, it looks like a good deal. I think you go, you can go septic. Um, yeah. and it's just not, it's not ideal for a multifamily, of course. But you could you could do septic, um, and you could bring in you know like an RV park or what have you, you know, or bring some mobile homes out there. And because of the location, that's something we're looking at. Or just right now, you, you you're shooting this too with, with the supply side and labor. It's hard to get anything done. Mm-hmm. To be honest, there's a part of me is I'm gonna I might I might buy some land and sit tight, you know, until things settle down a little bit. Yeah, I've seen multifamily. I've seen 
30, 40 units on septic, believe it or not. So yeah, they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a good environment, you know, that's a, you know, more than, it's not just Austin, it's Texas, you know, like Joe fine. He came from California and there's so many people like that where they want to be in an environment where they can actually, you know, get things done. Yeah. Another thing that folks have been saying about Austin is, you know, it's like, if you're going to buy where the, the average apartment door is $150 to build, but it's 250 to buy, like you really want to go vertical if you can, that's if you can find the land. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting. Some of these guys, they're they're all over the place. You know, they're 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 putting a facelift on a, you know, a apartment units. You know, the best, and then also doing a facelift on a C. And you know, saying it's, there's there's just nowhere to live. You know, I mean, if, if I were building an office complex right now midstream, I, I would convert it. You know, to yeah. uh, an apartment. You know, that's that's what's going on here. We're, we're all working from home, but there's nowhere to nowhere to live, and people are making money. And, like I said, Hayes County and all the all the suburbs are going crazy too. So, oh yeah, you almost can't go wrong right now, but there's a lot of ways to go extra right too. Uh, so, yeah. Charles, what attracted you to real estate investing initially? It sounds like you've had a long career. Yeah, yeah. MBA. What made you re- shift your focus these last couple of years? Yeah, it was it was of you know building my you know my my tax practice. It's like this is transactional, you know, <laughs> it's transactional. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of underlying knowledge. So if you can be that go-to person, it's fantastic. And, you know, if you're doing taxes for the syndicator, how many passive investors and active investors does that person know? And my instinct is right. You know, it's, it's just, it's just a good network for the kind of, you know, I'm a sole practitioner, so mm-hmm. I'm going to probably bring some folks in to help out. But at the end of the day, it, it's that kind of size individual. They're not necessarily companies, you know, they're like, everybody's doing an LLC, of course, you know, for liability purposes and partnership purposes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's leverage. There's a lot of opportunities. There's also opportunities for mistakes. And that's, you know, where I like to, you know, come in and help people, you know, one, and this is, I'll, I'll jump to year end for this specific one. Uh, okay. The LLC is, is going to be you know pretty much perfect. If it's simple, it's by yourself, you spouse, a few other people, what have you. Um, it's going to pass through, we can be the active and passive in a minute, but the main thing, if it's a, you know, you're flipping, there's a lot, is a, some, a lot of ordinary income in that LLC. Eventually it's going to show up. It's going to pass through what you'd like for the losses. You don't like it for gains because it passes through as ordinary and he's smiling. <laughs> you know, that's where this is going. And you have to pay the double social security and Medicare. Mm-hmm. And th- that's, that's where you don't want to be. So you, you either you want to load that whole LLC with some passive losses of another, you know, type of investment, or you at least can structure it differently. And this is something you literally can do by year end. It's getting close because, all right, here's the rule. When you're in, you, you, you can keep your LLC, keep your banking, keep your federal ID number within the first 75 days, you can, have a, it's called form 2553. But the main thing is you can have S corp election for the, within the first 75 days. Everything's the same, except now you can pay yourself a salary. Hmm. So why would you want to do that? First, an LSA cannot pay the owner a salary. Why would you want to do that? Because the S corp is not going to pay that earned income tax on the net. Uh, the S corp, let's say if you make $100,000 of earned income, and this is, doesn't even have to be real estate. You make 100000 you pay yourself fifty. you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. You can't make 200000 and pay yourself ten. That just is, that's not going to fly. But if you're making, you know, it's depending how much it is, but 50% is a good start. That 50000 to 120s or 40000 seems to be, you know, fairly reasonable. And let's make the math easy. The company makes 100000 and right now it passes through to you, and you pay the Social Security and Medicare, right? That sucks. But if you pay yourself a salary of 50, that's still kind of painful because you're paying Social Security, Medicare, so is the company. But then the net, 50,000 less the payroll taxes, you're not paying, you still pay income tax on it, but not that double social. So that's, now I said 75 days, you, you can send that in. And I've done like three or four of these this, the last two weeks where it's folks who had an LLC within three years and you basically ask for forgiveness. And, you know, especially like, hey, I worked with an attorney to set this up, not a CPA. I didn't know the rules. I always was intending on paying myself. 
and we're sending that in. We're, we're faxing one copy, we're mailing another. And uh, the IRS is slow processing. That's not, you know, it's gotten, it's gotten pretty bad. But that's one thing you could do year end um, if your LLC is less than three years old. Okay. The other thing is to start from scratch, you know, for a new uh, LLC with an S4 collection. Okay, so what you're saying is, is, you know, open a, either open a new LLC or if your LLC is less than three years old, elected it to be an S Corp. Yes, S, yeah. you have the same name, exactly. So it's S Corp treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. So you send in, those, send in those forms and then what I say is kind of tight is then you pay yourself a payroll. Mm -hmm. um, and the payroll has to be reasonable. So the company's made a hundred thousand. You're trying to get out of paying social security, and Medicare for the whole deal. Mm -hmm. So basically you'll say, Oh, I'm let's make it 60, make it easy. So I'm going to pay myself $2,500 or 5,000 a month, 25, you know, twice a month. You only have one payroll left if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. So you pay yourself, you know, the 5,000 for the month, excuse me. And then a catch up payroll, you know, kind of a bonus 55,000. So now, you know, at the end of the day, you say, hey, I had to get the election. You know, we're assuming it's going through. So we just go forward with it. And it looks like and I had to pay myself 60000 at the end of the year or 50000 or whatever it is. So, so that's that's what I would work with a couple of people. And, you know, if you're working with ADP, Gusto, uh, QuickBooks, it's really tight. You know, you probably have to do it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> all seriousness. Um, you know, you can't back it. It has to be out of pocket, you know. A regular payroll. If you already have payroll, you know, you're an LLC and you're paying a few other people mm -hmm. has W-2s, then adding you on would be pretty easy. And you probably have a little more time. But you know, everyone I've talked, you know, we were today we were filing payroll for normal payroll for the end of the year. So I don't see how it'd be really it'd be a challenge. <laughs> but it would be possible. Awesome. I'll think about it next year. Yeah. Especially that window, you know, if you if you did open it in uh December 2018, I would at least file for that election if you still have time, you know, <laughs> that treatment. So awesome. That's, that's, that's cool. So, you know, I, I know that that's, like you said, that's more general advice that could be applied to anybody that has yes. an LLC mm -hmm. they open within the last couple of years. Could you give us advice for, for real estate investors specifically on how mm -hmm. they can avoid paying too much in tax over the next well, of course, for 2021, uh, they're going to have to file in the next couple of months. Maybe you can get an extension. You file, yeah. whatever. but whatever you do now, it's going to help you set that up right. What can you do now to avoid paying too much in tax for 2021? Have you wanted to be part of GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, but just haven't hit that millionaire status yet? Well, now you can, not even being a millionaire, by joining our new program, GoBundance Emerge. My name's Jamie Gruber, creator of GoBundance Emerge and member of the GoBundance community. And now you can join. GoBundance.com slash emerge. GoBundance.com slash emerge. Use code Jordan for $100 off this 12-week goal-setting program and mastermind that'll propel you to being a whole-life millionaire. Yeah, it depends on your structure. You know, if you're a W-2, you're kind of limited. If you're W-2 and a real estate investor, you might have passive losses you can't even take because you're making too much money. But if you're a W-2, at least make sure if you can afford it, max out your health savings account through payroll, end of year, maybe too late or tomorrow, and max out your 401k. Um, if, you're a, a so, if you have a solo 401k inside your real estate investment LLC, um, you might be, it might be set up where you can do both an employer and employee contribution, even though it's both you, the employee contribution has to be done by the end of the year, you know, so that those are, those, those are retirements. But in general, if you're doing a SEP, IRA, some of these other options, it's going to be, you know, April 15th for the most part. Okay. The next year retirements. There's also the spending, you know, again, it's like if you're W-2, it's going to be hard. But if you have any, if you have any 1099 income coming through or earn K-1 income coming through, you can, you can still put some expenses there, you know, and that would, you know, like, this is a good one. You can buy the, the heavy Tesla, for example, or whatever you have. Yeah. If it's a 6,000 or above, you get the $25,000 appreciation plus the bonus. Um, if it's not the heavy one, then it's only like, 10 to or something, but, uh, and then you would depreciate it based on business and personal use. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you brought it now and it's, and you went to a couple of meetings, looked at some real estate and didn't do anything else, 
and, and keep track of that, it could be hundred percent of business, you know? So, you know, the biggest challenge of that finding inventory, I had guys who were going to buy, you know, they're, they're, they're syndicators. They have an LLC making some money and they were both going to buy cars because, you know, they need to see clients in a nice car or it was, it was a, even a heavy car. It was, you know, like the Tesla I was talking about, or the, the Lexus can be that, you know, as heavy mm-hmm. and they were ready to roll, but there was just nothing. You know, one guy was in Arizona and the other in Texas and couldn't find any inventory. So that's unfortunate. But, and you can, you can finance that and you'd be able to write off the interest and everything. The only thing you can't do is the standard reduction. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. So uh, for, but, for people listening, what you're referring to, Charles, is the, the write-off you can get for buying an, a new car. You know, over 6,000 pounds is it, is it right? Yeah, over 6,000 pounds is even more, you know. And, and when we say a new car, it's new to you. So you could buy a used yeah. car that's new to you. And, you know, if you, if it was 6,000 pounds and you paid $25,000 and you got that thing year end, it was only for business because you paid 25, you could write off the whole thing. Yeah. If you can find it. Great. And even used cars are hard to find. It's like real estate, you know, that's the end of the day. Where, where, where are we going to live? What are we going to drive? Yeah. I don't Any know. Any car is hard to find right now. It's so hard. To yeah. 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 Oh. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the main th- Now here's, here's another situation. We're talking about active investors, mm-hmm. but you and I were talking about, you know, doing your own thing, you know, so you're not, it's not, you're literally, you know, you're house hacking or you're, you're, you're buying a third property and that's an active investment. You know, you're, you're actively managing it. Let's say you're, you're pretty much doing everything or, you know, a fair amount. I'm not going to go for the minutia of those rules, but saying you're an active manager when it's you and a friend or a spouse or whatever, it's, it's going to be a pretty easy argument to win. Same deal. This, you, you're going to be depreciating. We're cost. We're doing cost segregation in a minute. So if you're in that active investment, you can obviously spend more money. You know because you're going to have a schedule E. So you have the rental income. You have the depreciation. We're talking to in detail and all these other expenses. And you know maybe you decide to prepay me or you're a lawyer. Um, uh, real estate taxes. If you can you know prepay them early. You know, you pay two, pay two years in one, that can work. It doesn't work so much like for standard deductions anymore because that, that $10,000 limit, you know, there's so few people are, you know, able to standard, do a standard deduction. But um, yeah, so if you're an active investor, that's where you can, hey, I'm going to do the repairs right now. I'm going to write off the new fridge I had to put it. I'm going to buy it now. I'm going to put it on a credit card before year end if I'm tight on cash. So the passive person is going to be almost like a W2, just a lot less, you know, so you just, I would, the passive person, I would just really want to understand what you have actively know what's, what's going on. You know, are you, you know, it might be the third year and you're after a facelift and what, you know, you acquired apartment complex, partial owner, and you're starting to get some pretty nice cash coming in and you're not sweating it because Oh yeah, I got all this cash year two and years one and two, I was, you know, taking a loss. I didn't sweat it. Well, maybe by now they depreciated so aggressively that it might be a, you know, a gain at some point. So that's, you know, give them a, give them a ring, you know, send them an email and say, what's going on, you know? So at least you, you want to have some expectations. I think, you know, you, you want, you want to plan what's going to look like going forward. And then there's a whole nother complicated story of when you sell it. You know, could you, you might have all these, pass, you know, it could be, you got a bunch of passive losses, you know, three different properties, but one of them is going to sell at a big gain. Okay. Well, that big gain, you know, that's hopefully it's a you know, long term gain. And it depends on where you are. And that's when you decide like, how much, you know, retirement can I do? I mean, you, if you don't make a ton of money and your spouse doesn't work, you might be able to do an IRA for them. And, and you know, when you, if there's a capital gain coming in, then the strategy is to get you in the lowest bracket possible. You know, if your tax, you, you smile, he doesn't, if your taxable income is, you know, 80,000 or less and it's zero. So what can you do, you know, with retirement options potentially, you know, that's even if you're a W2. So, so the passive person, you know, it, you're going to get the, you'll get a capital gain then, you know, which would be much larger because you're going to have these losses that are triggered, but then you get to take the losses as well at the same time. Okay. 
So what, what you're referring to is the, the difference in capital gains for tax brackets. And this is yes. a lot of the reason why people do seller financing because they don't want to get hit with that whole gain in one year. Right. That's a great point. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at seller financing to as a purchaser be, because you might get a better deal, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe the seller financer is able to help you out because your, your numbers don't look right. You know, you can't necessarily qualify. Sure. And we talked a little, you, you mentioned it. We haven't talked about it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about cost segregation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Could yeah. you explain cost segregation for the listeners? Cause people are hearing cost segregation or cost seg for sure. Right. They okay. don't really know what that is. So can you explain yeah. that real quick? Yeah. Well, let's, let's go. I'm going to go for, if you're passive, you just, you just did five or 10% of the deal. But I'm going to talk it, talk to it through just one property, you know, mm -hmm. or it can be multifamily. You know, you, you have a, you have a duplex and you paid 600,000 for it. Okay. You paid 600,000. A good part of that is land. The best place to get land, the land value is probably the appraisal, you know, the, the Travis County appraisal, Williamson County, that'll probably give you a lower appraisal than what it's actually worth. You want the land to be as low as possible and reasonably documented so that you have more to depreciate. Mm -hmm. Let's say the land was 50,000 on the, on the, uh, the, on the dockets. So you have 600,000 less 50 in land. You have 550 to depreciate or write off. If the land is higher then the building is less. Now in that building, normally you would take that 550 divided by 27.5. So, you know, that's, that's 2000 a year. It doesn't, it doesn't move the needle too much. Right. But what are you getting in there? Uh, was it furnished? Did the refrigerator convey? There's carpet. How long does the carpet last? Not that long, right? You, you, you know, uh, cabinetry. And that's the cost segregation is, is looking the, in the inside of the actual facility and saying how much is building and building improvements versus, you know, leasehold improvements, essentially, you know, infrastructure that's you, you're going to have to fix. There's toilets in there. They, you, they don't last forever, you know? toilets, sinks, um, built-in bookshelves, and you start depreciating some of those items over five or seven, 10, 15 years. And it starts adding up a lot. And especially if it's, if it's a new property, you just acquire it in theory that, you know, so, you know, there's a possibility for immediate depreciation, you know, if, if you're building something, you know, that's, that's what you want to do. But putting, putting that aside, if you have 550,000 divided by 27.5, because that's 2,000 a month, I mean, a year, what happens if it's 100,000 divided by 10? You know, the average between all those things I was mentioning it. So that's going to be, you know, 100,000 divided by 10, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's 10,000. So it, it, it's, yeah, I shouldn't be doing the math, man. I think it's 20. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Essentially, so you, you depreciate less building, but it's divided by 27.5 versus the smaller stuff and divided by 10. Or if you're building, you know, something from scratch, you write that off right away. Yeah. As opposed to the building, you can't write off the building right away, but you can know the other stuff. Yeah. So essentially what it is for everybody listening, the mm -hmm. accelerated depreciation where you say, hey, the toilet yeah. only lasts five years, the carpet only lasts six right. years, the, this, yeah. this, that only lasts seven, eight, nine um, what the government allows us to do with depreciation, and I'm not the CPA, Charles is the CPA, so mm -hmm. he'll back me up or tell me I'm wrong here. Yeah. Um, what the government allows us to do with depreciation is over a 27 and a half year, year period, mm -hmm. you can write off portions of the property because it does depreciate. Things yeah, wear, right. wear out, they need to be replaced. What yeah. they've allowed us to do with cost segregations and accelerated depreciation is is break all that out and say, hey, mm -hmm. this lasts this long, that lasts this long. So here's the schedules we're going to use for each of these things. So like Charles mentioned, if you have a toilet and the toilet costs, toilets don't cost very much anymore. Yeah. Let's say it's $200. Instead of writing that off over 27 and a half years, maybe you can write it off over seven. So you can right. take, take a lot more depreciation now when you do a cost segregation. Yeah, that's a really, yeah, you were perfect. I think, yeah, thank you. Um, that was complimentary, uh, you know, putting a little meat on the bone there. 
you don't get your over the life of the property, you're not writing off more than the total. You're just doing it quicker. Mm -hmm. And as a passive investor, that's what you're going to see because a lot of your passive investing is going to flip. It's going, it's going to move. You know, you look at these projects and they talk about, you know, the end of the term, five to seven years, you know, quality opportunity zones usually five to seven years. So during that period, that's when they're all the cost segregation and you're getting all those losses, losses until it's time to sell. Like, yeah, it's a long-term capital gain. Yeah. It's zero or 10 or 25, you know, 20%. So mm -hmm. that, that's, it's pretty clear. And they gave you some opportunities. It's totally legit. Yeah. And there's so many ways to not pay taxes. And it's so easy for people to get upset about you not paying taxes, but the, the government gives us these really easy yeah, there's ways. There's nothing right. Hey guys, this is Jordan Moorhead here. And I wanted to ask if you could do a huge favor for me. If you could go leave a review for this podcast, wherever you're listening to it, that would really help me get this into the hands of other people that are interested in information about Austin real estate investing. And I'd be able to help more people. Thanks guys. You know, that's like with year end, you had those choices. You know, I was talking about spending money, mm -hmm. but maybe this is not a good year for you. You know, you got laid off, it's COVID, what have you, you know, next year is going to be good. So you're not going to buy any of that stuff I was talking about. You're going to get that card next year, next December, what have you. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that, that's the most legitimate thing you can do is, is massage between years. And it's just being careful. And, you know, you made a good point. You were saying, what does it look like to go three, four, five years down the road? That's what you need to do. That's what, you know, working with your CPA, what's your game plan? Maybe you will be a real estate professional in four or five years. But that should factor in how you invest right now. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah I think it's important to have a great CPA like Charles who can help you plan for the future. <laughs> rather than just going to H&R Block and having your taxes done right now. Yeah, and, and, you, and you hate to walk in there able. You know, we already talked about a couple of things, and, and especially if you do it every year, you know, it's like, oh, it's a drag, and it becomes a mechanical exercise. There's no strategy. There's nothing to, you know, take advantage. Just play by the rules and save a lot of money. You know, there's, there's people hire the kids, you know. <laughs> you, have a, you have an LLC and you're paying people. You know, the kids are doing legitimate work. You know, they, you can pay them something and it goes to their, their bracket and their uh, standard deduction. Yeah. Keep it in the family and get a write off for it. Yeah. Couldn't be better than that. Right. So Charles, obviously you're, you're really engrossed in the real estate investing industry and the tax side of things. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Do you have any long-term goals or really just a vision of where, where you. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. I, I would, I would love to be a syndicator myself, you know, you know, be, be part of the deal team. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty fun. And, you know, I've, I've had a lot of clients and they have quite a, you know, <laughs> scores of K ones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, sometimes a lot more. So basically, you know, that's a good experience to have is dealing with investor, you know, people that's their, that's their money. They, if nothing else, tell them what's going on. Um, oh yeah. This is a subject I, I want to make sure we, we, we touch on. And that is, um, you know, what's a bad deal. You know, how do I avoid that? How do I avoid taxes? You know, sure. you, you obviously send them an email, communicate with them, say, say, what's going on? Say, okay, I understand here's my cash flow, which is probably right there on the brochure or whatever. What is going to be my, what are the tax consequences? And then they might be saying, oh, you're going to get a huge loss. And they're like, oh, I can afford this because I'm going to write off, you know, they're going to do this fantastic cost segregation. And I put in $35,000 and I can write off 35,000 the first year. Hmm. That's, that's possible, you know, because of just leverage and other people's money kind of, you can't write up more than 35, but once you wrote up 35, you're kind of stuck. It also is probably passive. And if you have a big W2, if it's passive, you're totally stuck. You know, you're not going to write that thing off. It's, you know, you have three buckets of income. You have the earned income, you have the portfolio income, and then you have the passive. And the passive losses, you don't get to take unless you're a real estate professional mm -hmm. or they're offsetting passive income. So I always tell people, don't just chase the tax gain. Maybe there's some really good passive income and it doesn't have to be real estate. Mm -hmm. That's coming to you essentially tax-free because you have all those passive losses because you're depreciating and it's probably leverage as well. You know, there's some, there's some loans going on. So. And there's a, there's a smaller limit for non-real estate professionals for losses that they can take every year. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, I, I touched on that a little bit. 
is you need to be active. Mm -hmm. And so there is a small limit. So it's one of those, you know, I've talked to some guys, if you're, you know, just a gross, gross income is under a hundred thousand and you're an active investor, that's you, know, you and buddy, spouse, whatever, you could be hacking. And so that duplex B is, is, you know, it has a loss that if you, if your W2 is huge, you might not get to take that loss. On the other hand, if your W2 is under a hundred thousand, well, W2 is less standard deduction, all that. And the retirement you might want to play to make it lower. If it's under a hundred thousand and you have a loss of an active property, you get to take the whole, you can take up to $25,000. Mm -hmm. And if it's 30,000 in the law, it just gets suspended. But if it's 30,000 losses and it's, and it's passive or if it's 30,000 losses and you're making 250, it just gets suspended. But it's between 100 and under, you get the whole 25 and then it phases out 50 cents on the dollar up to 150. Okay. But again, it's which year, you know, you, you, maybe one year, that's when you take it. And that's really going to help. And you make sure you're under 100 or at 125 or something. That's, that's why that multi-year planning is so important, you know, yeah. getting the third, fourth year, at least two in a row. I say, what's it, what's it look like next year, you know? And, and maybe you have control over that. You know, I, I see syndicators, you know, they talk to the deal sponsor and they're kind of ready to close. And, and then the sponsor said, do you want me to pay you in December or January? I'm like, give Charlie a call. I'll give you some insight into that. that. That's a beautiful thing. You could have a W-2 and maybe your boss is talking about doing a Christmas bonus in January. Say, yeah, you know, it, it depends how much flexibility you have, you know, in, the, in that environment. Awesome. So, you know, a couple of things we've covered, uh, cost segregations, how that's mm -hmm. accelerating your depreciation. Yeah. Um, identifying the proper type of corporation for you and how you can control your yeah. taxes there. Mm -hmm. And then just tax planning. So make sure you're planning your taxes and being proactive about taxes rather than just scrambling last minute to get your taxes done. It yeah. It costs you a lot of money. It, it does. And then it gets so bad. I, I work with a lot of people who haven't filed three, four or five, six years. Oh, wow. And it's just like that one year becomes two and it gets worse and worse. It's like, if you hate going to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned, it's really hard to get your teeth cleaned in that fourth year. It's even worse in the sixth year and you pay for it. You know, you're going to pay cause you're going to have to get dentures and you're going to pay with the IRS. But I do work with a lot of people with, uh, um, offers and compromise, you know, versus bankruptcy. Um, there's some good options, you know, a lot of people here in Austin, they, they might be able to, you know, refi or do a, he a HELOC cause they have equity in their house, mm -hmm. but to sell that house, what does the IRS thinks, think that their lien is? And, you know, I'm working with, you know, one person where, the problem is, you know, we, we made amended returns that are going to legitimately say that he or she's going to owe a lot less money. Mm -hmm. They're still in process limbo, you know, because if you send it to me, yeah, if you send an amended return, 20, you know, 2017, 18, 19, even at 20 at this point, you know, because it's past October 15th, it's sitting in the box. It's in the inbox. You had a mount. You couldn't even e-file it. So I, yeah, I know I, I have no control over that. We're like, we're, we're trying to find a good attorney to see if they can, you know, work something out. Wow. Yeah. So try to avoid that. And it's going to make it so much, you know, what, what makes it easy. A lot of people are like, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to owe. Well, work for your CPA during the year and have a feel for it. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Not only are you paying lower taxes, you know, what's coming down the pipeline. Sure. You have an idea. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I know we talked a little bit about books before this. Yeah. Do you have a few books you'd like to recommend to people that are favorite tax books of yours? Yeah, this, this, I love this one. Um, Advanced Tax Strategies, Cracking. How does that look? Yeah, if you can see the, yeah. the authors. Yeah, the authors. Is it backwards? Anyway. Amanda Hahn and Matthew McFarland. Yeah, yeah. You look those two up. Uh, this is the advanced one. I try to read it like I was a layman and I think you could follow it. There's the one beforehand, but it covers the cost segregation. Um, it covers a lot if you're doing a real estate investing through a self-directed IRA or 401k. That's really interesting. That's a whole other topic, but you, but you should be up to speed or, you know, ask the right questions, mm -hmm. you know, to your CPA or enrolled agent. 
So that, 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 that book is super valuable. You know, it, it just reads easy and it's, you know, 200 pages. And that's the advanced tax strategies for real estate investors. There's and there's one before it. Yeah. The tax yeah. strategies before it. Those are yes. both great books. I've read both of them. Yeah. Um, I think just having general ideas of what, what's possible helps so much because yeah, like we talked about earlier, don't walk into your CPA's office on April 15th and expect them to tell you all yeah. the things that you could do to reduce your taxes when it's probably too late. Yeah. yeah. It, it had the same, you know, it was like, at least be able to ask questions and have the same thing as a passive investor, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can have a, a, a slick brochure and talk all the talk and like, and, and the P, you know, try to read, if you can't, if you can't read the PPM, at least ask what's the deal, what is the deal? You know, just tell me straight, get an email, if nothing else. Now you have some written proof, say, this is the way it's going to be structured. You know, what is the preferred, what's the waterfall? What am I getting paid? Because what you want is it to be aligned, you know, mm -hmm. you, you want to get, you know, if that guy makes a ton of money because you did too, great. You know, he could, he could get, or she, 60% of the profits. I don't care as long as I, I made my preferred and then some upside. But you want to make sure that you're that, that you're aligned, and you know, hopefully, there's expectations for when they when they when are they going to communicate with you, let you know what's going on, because most deals are going to be hard, you know, right in this environment, you know, you just because you know, like Austin's expensive, we have supply side issues, we can't have a vehicle to buy, <laughs> our lumber is expensive and labor, it's hard to get people. You know, the, the drive through at the major banks here in town has been closed for ten weeks. Wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, definitely talk if you're investing with somebody else, talk to them about what, what are the tax implications of being investing yeah. here? Talk to your CPA, make yeah. sure you're planning your taxes. Sure. So on to that, Charles, how can people get a hold of you? How can they reach out to you to learn more, maybe use you and, and learn more about yeah. your services? Um, I will, uh, you know, my email is the best. Mm -hmm. Look at this chat thing. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's Devaney, you can see my name, DevaneyCPA at gmail.com. Awesome. Really easy. put that in the show notes for everybody too, but Devaney, D-E-V-A-N-Y, -E 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 yeah. CPA at gmail.com. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's, and there's, a, there's a website, same thing, you know, the website's going to be. Awesome. And come to the Commercial Investors Lunch in Austin on Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah, say so if you, you know. So, you know Say, oh, yeah, I heard you the other day. You know what you're talking about. That's great. I'll <laughs> do some more yeah. Yeah. yeah, the lunches are great. Monday night on January 10th. Um, just a great opportunity to learn. You know, a lot of people, like, they're just new. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't want to read a 200-page book, so they go and ask questions that way. But, yeah, I got to, you know, you don't want to Amazon for 20 bucks. Yeah. Go to your, your local library. There's some, there's some good stuff out there. It's a, the more information you have, you're going to be empowered. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And absolutely, absolutely read those two books, Tax Strategies and Advanced Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investing. Yeah, like, yeah, Hans and McFarland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, James Katasami. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Um, do you know him? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Double check my spelling. But yeah, he, he wrote a book. He wrote, he wrote the book on passive investing. It's really... Mm -hmm. Because he started, you know, like everyone, he started as a passive in, investor. You know, he was like you, and then before you know it, there's quite a bit. And, and now he's just a syndicator. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, rec I recommend his book on passive. Again, it's very, it's, a, it's an easy read, you know, and the, the layman uh, and professional will pick up some things here and there. All right. So, uh, we'll have that in the show notes too, guys. James right. Canvas Sammy. Um, mm -hmm kind of spelled how you say it so pretty easy actually uh real quick charles last yeah. question we got for sure. you today we got to get out of here here soon what is your favorite restaurant here in austin yeah you, you got to go text me well okay i'll tell you my barbecue i'm not gonna wait in line franklin's is great but i'm not gonna wait in line yeah so i would rather be in an air-conditioned car and drive to lockhart or taylor mm -hmm. louis miller's you know our crisis are good places Louis so, Mueller's and Taylor. Louis Mueller's and Taylor. That actually, that's the legacy of Franklin's. Mm -hmm. He either worked there or the guy worked there and, and showed him how to be a pitmeister. And Franklin's is great, but anyway. And then Lockhart does prices and 
yeah. We, anyway, that's great. Um, if I got more time and, and money, uh, papacitas, I love the chicken fajitas, you know, and then, uh, I like La Mancha on North loop. It's kind of their uh, beef enchiladas is kind of a mole a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just good for laid back night. Lots of, lots of awesome rest, lots of awesome restaurants in Austin. Uh, yeah, it's, Louis Mueller's is in Taylor. Mm-hmm. This is in uh, Lockhart. Lockhart, and then there's Blacks in Lockhart. There's a yeah, couple other and one here in town in Lockhart that are amazing. They're actually yeah. two different Blacks. I just realized that um, one yeah. is the son and one is the father. So the one in Austin is the son. The father is right. the one in Lockhart. Um, yeah, I got a close funny story. Was it Kreitz's in? Uh, I forgot the name of the other big place. Mm-hmm. And basically, the guy. Uh, Mr. Christ died and his, his son, and I think it was son and daughter had a big fight over who got the business and who got the location mm-hmm. and it was split. And so they literally took the barbecue that had been on the fire for decades and they put it in a wheelbarrow and took it down the street to the new location. Oh, <laughs> it was like a parade and everything. And they're still up there. Um, yeah. it's, <laughs> that location's massive. Yeah, yeah, and I can't remember the name of it. You know, it's not crisis, but anyway, I, I think it was. I think that has the crisis fire. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. All right, Charles, thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Anybody wants to reach out to Charles Devaney CPA on Google or just Devaney uh, CPA Jimmy, yeah. at gmail dot com, and he'll yeah. get back to you. And he'd love to help you learn more about absolutely how to avoid taxes yeah. in real estate. Yeah, make some money. Let's you know, have some fun with it. Let's do it. All right, y'all have a great and safe holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. All right, bye-bye. Bye.